Innovation and technological advances have always closely followed human struggle, as different nations and people struggle to find better ways to defeat the other while keeping the own casualties as low as possible. In this regard, World War I was no different. In fact, with technological advanced nations chucking it out on the battlefield, the advancement in technology made for some stunning discoveries. The most prominent of these remembered nowadays were probably those made in medicine. Today we are going to have a look at six innovations and advances in aviation. Before we dive straight in, it should be mentioned that the war acted as a catalyst to many of these advancements, catapulting them into the mainstream. Many of them had already existed in experimental forms before the war, but it really was the Great War that made them attractive to the contending nations. Nummer 1. Number 1. First innovation we're going to look at is the synchronization gear. The war in the sky didn't really kick off until the Battle of Verdun in 1916. While aviation was used in supporting roles before that, and occasionally even in air superiority missions, it really was this battle at the Meuse River that took things to the next level. During the battle, the balance of power shifted multiple times. Initially, the German Fokker Eindeckers had a distinct advantage of the Allied Air Force, and that was the synchronization gear also known as an interrupter. Based on a Swiss design before the war, Dutch engineer and inventor Anthony Fokker created a mechanism that allowed a machine gun to fire through the propeller without damaging it, by interrupting the gun in the moments when the propeller passes the muzzle. The Allies did not have such a system, forcing them to mount their machine guns with limited ammo drums on the top wings of their aircraft. Although the French quickly sent the superior Newport 11, Newport 11 into the fight, the advantage of the synchronization gear stayed with the Germans for a considerable time. Of course, later on in the war, the Allies would catch up and also field planes with a synchronized machine gun. Special mention should be given at this point to French aviator Roland Garros. In 1914 and 15, he experimented by placing steel plates on his propellers to allow him to fire through the helix with bullets bouncing off harmlessly if they struck the propeller. While these propellers had to be replaced multiple times, he did in fact succeed in shooting down three German aircraft and became the first pilot to do so while firing through the propeller. Number 2. Number two. So let us talk about radio then. Early on in the war there was no direct way for planes to communicate with the ground. This led to a system of flares and signs being used. Messages were also sometimes handwritten and then dropped on friendly forces in small containers. With reconnaissance becoming ever more important, however, especially when it came to assisting the artillery to bombard a specific target into oblivion, some direct way of communication was necessary. Thus, some planes would be equipped with transmitters that allowed them to sign coded messages in Morse code. Note, however, they did not in fact have receivers, so the communication was one way only. Later on, radio transmitters and receivers became common on planes that were able to carry them allowing planes to directly influence the battle on the ground. While not yet really sophisticated, the introduction of early radio transmitter and receivers did help aerial reconnaissance, but the onset of the use of radio in warfare had other consequences too. For example, German Zeppelins were suspected by the British to have used British radio waves to triangulate their course towards London in order to bomb the city. Nummer 3. Number 3. Now let us talk about parachutes. The idea of a parachute existed since antiquity really, and became publicly known by the 20th century. But now with planes fighting for dominance, serious thought was given to the idea of a safety device that would allow pilots and observers in balloons quickly evacuate their station if push comes to shove. In doing so, the soldier could later fly again, and his experience would be saved. Obviously, the idea did not attract unilateral support, with various arguments being given against it. One of these was the thought that a pilot with a parachute would not fight as hard as one without, since he always had a way out. One other problem, however, and this is more on the practical side, was that planes didn't really account for the space and as such especially fighter pilots could rarely fit them inside the cockpit. Initially, parachutes were issued to observers sitting high up in balloons and eventually the German Air Force would also issue parachutes to their pilots, but being early versions, these did not always work and that pilots would have to wait a little bit longer until they were issued with their own. Nummer 4 Number 4 as the war progressed, aircraft performance became critical, so let's talk about the design of the actual aircrafts. There was a lot of experimentation with aircraft designs. During the war, mono, bi and triplanes saw service, 
with each having some advantages over the other designs. The biplane design stayed around the longest, being mainstream up until mid-1930s. Yet it was this early period that allowed engineers to learn a lot about how to build a high-performance yet durable aircraft. Small things like how to align the wings with each other or how to strengthen the struts between the wings were being worked on consistent in the attempt to gain some advantage over the enemy. For example, have you ever noticed how biplanes sometimes have lower wings that are not as long as the top one? These are called sesquiplanes and they were common next to the traditional biplane design that had wings of the same length. One of the results of a sesquiplane was that the drag was reduced, generally allowing for more speed with the same performance. Number 5 Number 5 Now you might be surprised to hear about drones when we talk about World War One. In fact, in 1916, the first unmanned flying drones were built in the United States. Especially the Hewitt's Berry automatic airplane can be considered somewhat of a precursor to the modern cruise missile, although that would be a little bit of a stretch. Although flying by autopilot, the drone lacked the accuracy required to make it viable versus a moving target. Even Zeppelin's one potential target were unlikely to be hit. Attempts were made to get the drones to obey commands by radio, these proved to be unsuccessful. Ultimately, the drones did not see service in World War I and some issues persisted for years. Attempts to iron out these problems failed and the concept was mothballed in the 1920s. Yet it is interesting to see how quickly the idea of an unmanned drone for military purposes followed the overall use of airplanes in the military. The drones suffered the same fate as the rockets that the French experimented on to shoot down balloons. Delayed until technology made them viable. Nummer 6. Number 6. But let's get back into the cockpit. Early on in the war, pilots had no specialized gun or bomb sight. In fact, they were forced to aim down sight. In a bomber, the good old Mark 1 eyeball was the only real aid in trying to get the explosive somewhere close to the target. But while initially the sights were not that important, after all fighter versus fighter combat only really took off in 1916, and planes were initially limited to news and bombing raids, lacking the bomb load for a real bombardment mission, this quickly changed. Some of the early gun sites in fact uncannily resembled those that we know from World War II. The bomb sites too were becoming more and more sophisticated. 1912, a British pilot won a prize after he landed 12 out of 15 hits on a target from 800 meters of altitude with his own personal built sight. Once bombing took off, sights became commonplace on bombers, allowing the crew to input speed and altitude, with later sights even allowing you to factor in wind and the differential between indicated and true airspeed. Those were some of the major advancements in aviation during World War I, and in the future I will probably go into some of these in more detail. Of course, more existed, and if you can think of any of them, why not put them in the comment section down below. As always, relevant sources are linked in the description. If you want to support my channel, consider sharing this video, and if you want to learn more about World War I aviation, check out this video I made on Oswald Bilke, a man who essentially crafted the manual on dogfighting. Or check out this video on the Fokker Eindecker for more information on this early German fighter plane. As always, have a great day, good hunting and see you in the sky.